In an earlier video, we demonstrated that an orthoscaling linear transformation is always represented by a symmetric matrix with respect to a Cartesian basis. This doesn't imply, of course, that every symmetric matrix corresponds to the kind of linear transformation that simply scales the space in some orthogonal directions. As you know, just because every horse is an animal doesn't mean that every animal is a horse. That's not even true. So just because every orthoscaling linear transformation is represented by a symmetric matrix doesn't necessarily imply that every symmetric matrix represents a linear transformation like that. That is something that still needs to be demonstrated and will largely do so in this video. And as you know, I'm not a big fan of rigorous proofs, but there are some proofs, or you can call them demonstrations, that are very insightful and very educational. And this will be one of those educational demonstrations, and I know that you'll learn a lot from it. Now, one more note. I would like for you to change your mindset a little bit. Until now, we have been very cognizant of the geometric features of the linear transformations. That has been a big part of our discussions until now. Well, starting with this video and for the next few, we're talking about properties of matrices. And matrices, of course, are algebraic objects. So we're going to have more algebraic discussions. And the proof that I'm about to present is pure algebra. And of course, we still have the backing of our beautiful geometric picture with respect to a Cartesian basis. And for the most part, this interpretation will remain valid. But it's also now holding us back a little bit. Because if, you're in, if you insist on geometry, you're limiting yourself to one, two, or three dimensions. And when you're talking about matrices and their properties, you're not at all limited to any number of dimensions. So the statements that we're going to be making in this video are algebraic and apply to matrices of arbitrary dimensions. And that's the advantage. Algebra can go further where geometry stops. That is not to say that we're giving up our geometric interpretation. It's just that it's going to play a secondary role right now. So in our discussion, we will still use the word orthogonal. And this will be a good preview of our talking about inner product. But now when we mean orthogonal, we mean orthogonal in the sense of algebraic dot product. And we're only talking about vectors in Rn. These are vectors in R3. And we'll call two vectors orthogonal, like we will these two, if their algebraic dot product is zero. And that's the case for these two vectors. We have one times one plus one times one plus one times negative two is zero. So when we say orthogonal in this and the next few videos, we mean, ve we mean vectors like this. These two vectors are also orthogonal, and these two vectors are orthogonal. And it's nice that this algebraic concept is once again not limited to three dimensions works in any number of dimensions. So here's what we're going to prove, partially. We're going to prove that every symmetric matrix, like this one, has a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and that eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. Now what happens when two eigenvalues are the same? In other words, when the multiplicity of one of the eigenvalues is greater than one. Well, then the eigenvectors can chosen to be orthogonal. It's a small nuance that we'll save until the next video. But now let's put this discussion in the context of arbitrary matrices. When we'll look for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of arbitrary matrices, not necessarily symmetric, then we encounter one of these three scenarios or a mix of these scenarios. We either find a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors meaning there are as many eigenvalues, counting multiplicities, as the dimension of the matrix, and just as many corresponding eigenvectors. Or the matrix might be defective, which means that there are fewer eigenvectors than there are eigenvalues counting multiplicities. Or we might find some complex eigenvalues. Well, as far as symmetric matrices are concerned, these two scenarios are not possible. Symmetric matrices always have full sets of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So symmetric matrices 
always have a full set of real eigenvalues. It never has complex eigenvalues. And the multiplicity of the corresponding eigenvectors matches the multiplicity of the eigenvalue. That's another reason why symmetric matrices are so important. They always represent the best case scenario, so to speak, when it comes to eigenvalue analysis. So now we're going to prove the part of the statement where we said that the eigenvectors, where we said that eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. Proving that symmetric matrices have a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors is actually a little bit advanced for this stage. We will definitely discuss it later in the course. For now, we'll focus on the orthogonality. And once again, it will be a very short and elegant argument. It, and although it's short, we'll need a little bit more space than we have right here. So let me take a moment to erase this. All right, so suppose that X and Y are two eigenvectors of the matrix S that correspond to two distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Let's write this down algebraically. We have that S times X equals, of course, lambda 1X. But I will save a little bit of space right here, lambda 1X. So something will go in here in just a moment. Now let's rewrite the statement concerning the vector y algebraically. And we have that s times y equals lambda 2y. And once again, I'm leaving a little bit of space. Now here's what I'm going to do. And I would like for you to appreciate just how purely algebraic this argument is. Even though it ultimately has a geometric interpretation, Right now we're just working with matrices and we can forget where these matrices came from, that there was some linear transformation with respect to this basis and so on and so forth. We're just focusing on the algebra of what's going on. So here is what we're going to do. We're going to take this identity and multiply both sides by Y transpose. Y transpose, Y transpose. So you see that until we talked about lengths, we never saw the transpose or had any need for it. But now that we're talking about lengths and therefore dot products, there is no hiding from the transpose. It's now front and center. And of course, this identity right here will multiply by X transpose on both sides. And let's deal with right-hand sides first because it's much easier. What we have on the right is y transpose x. It's just a number. Notice, by the way, that we had a matrix identity, and now it's still an identity that involves matrices, but now we have a number equals a number, because y transpose times x is, of course, a number, and this triple product is a number as well. So you must be aware of that. So y transpose x is simply matrix notation for the dot product of x and y as vectors in R3, and we're talking about the dot product in the algebraic sense. Once again, there's something in the geometric world that corresponds to this combination, and it's the length of the vector represented by x times the length of the vector represented by y times the cosine of the angle between them, if all of this is happening with respect to a Cartesian basis. But we can forget all of that by now and just focus on the algebra which is how most resources that you'll find on the web or anywhere else really operate. Okay, so this is just x dot y. And so is this. The order really doesn't matter. So this number equals this number. So what we're going to do in a moment is subtract this identity from this one. And on the right-hand side, things are clear. What we have is lambda 1 minus lambda 2 and because these are equal, we should just pick one. Let's go with x transpose y. That's, so that's what happens on the right-hand side. Now, what happens on the left-hand side? Well, we're going to show in two different ways that these two numbers are actually the same. I will show you a formal uh, bird's eye view proof and then a detailed proof. We will prove that these two numbers are the same. So on the left-hand side, we have zero. So this product equals zero. 
and lambda 1 and lambda 2 were assumed to be distinct. If they aren't distinct, this whole argument breaks down. But if they are distinct, then this number is not zero, then x transpose y needs to be the zero, and the implication is that x is orthogonal to y. Because x transpose y means x dot y equals zero, and that's our algebraic proof, algebraic definition of orthogonality. Now, just to complete the proof, we need to show that these two numbers are the same, and I'm looking for space to do it. So I'll do it right here, the formal proof, the formal bird's eye view proof that you must have complete mastery of. It's very important to be able to do this kind of matrix mani manipulation. We've done this kind of thing before, so I'm not going to go through it too slowly, but slowly enough that you can see the argument. So this triple product is a number, and this triple product is a number. So let's work, uh, doesn't matter, let's work with this. So what we're going to do is, because it's just a number, take its transpose. And when you take the transpose of a number, and when I say number, I really mean one by one matrix. So I can take its transpose and it'll be itself, because it's one by one, right? What does it mean to transpose a one by one matrix? Turn its columns into rows. Well, there's just one number. So it'll be the same number. And when we take the transpose of a product, as you know, we will have the product of the transposes in the opposite order. And notice that somewhere along this proof, we will need to use the symmetric property of the matrix S. We haven't yet. So here's what it'll come in. So when we take the transpose of this triple product, it will be the product of the transposes in the opposite order. So it will be X transpose, because now X comes first and it's the transpose, times S transpose. But S is symmetric. There it is. S transpose equals S. So I won't write down S transpose, I will just write down S times Y transpose transpose. And of course the transpose of the transpose is a mouthful, but it's also the matrix itself. So it's Y. It means flip it and then flip it again. So it comes back to being itself. So the transpose of this number is X transpose SY. And that's this number right here. So these two products are actually the same number. That's why when we subtracted them, we got zero and the proof is complete. Now just to finish things off, I promise a second proof of the fact that these two numbers are equal, more detailed proof, and it's also something that you've seen before, and I just want to repeat it now for completeness sake. When we consider, let's say, y transpose sx, it's a product of this kind right here. Here's y transpose, it might have y1, y2, y3, and here is x x1, x2, x3. And let's think about the one by one matrix that's the result of this product. It's one by one, so it's a single number, but it is a sum of nine terms. And remember our discussion, we've had this kind of discussion before, what are the nine terms? And once again, somewhere along this argument, we'll have to use the symmetric property of the matrix S. So here's what those nine numbers are. Each one of the nine terms in the sum will correspond to an entry in the matrix. Nine entries, nine terms. And each, and each entry will be multiplied by the same entry of this matrix as the row of this entry, and by the same entry from this matrix as the column of this entry. So this 4 will be multiplied by y2, and x1. So it'll correspond to 4, x1, y2 in the sum, and so forth. For example, this entry right here will correspond once again to y2 and x3. So it'll correspond to negative 3, x3, y2, and so on. Now, we realize that because the matrix is symmetric, going back to this 4, this 4 will give us y2 x1, but also because the same 4 appears in this entry right here, it'll give us y1 x2. 
So these cross terms, not diagonal terms, which are easily seen to be in both of these combinations, but these cross terms now come in pairs. When we consider this product right here, we'll have 4, 4 y2x1 plus 4 y1x2. That's if we consider this product. But if we consider this product, the y's would be replaced with the x's, and the x's will be replaced with the y's. So we have two terms where x's and y's trade places. But because these terms came in such perfect pairs, 4 x1 y2 plus y1 x2, or to make it alphabetical, x1 y2 plus x2 y1, both of them multiply 4. When we switch x and y around, and I really recommend that you listen to what I'm saying, but also go ahead and write it out. You will notice that we have the same two terms, and all because this matrix is symmetric. So this was a much wordier, but also much more detailed and much more uh, structural in terms of looking at the individual entries argument that showed that this number is the same as this number. So once again, the proof is complete. And we've concluded that when the eigenvalues are distinct, the corresponding eigenvectors are orthogonal. In the next video, we will show that if the eigenvalues are the same, in other words, the multiplicity is greater than one, then the corresponding eigenvectors can be chosen to be orthogonal.